This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes, empowering our vehicles, to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Hello, folks, and welcome to Plain Talk. Rob Port here with you, uh, as I always am, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday every week. Um, thank you all for listening as I start out every show. Uh, thanks for you who have subscribed to the podcast uh, via the very po- various podcasting apps. If you're not listening through an app, it would be great if you subscribed. If you just search, uh, I don't know, pick one that works for you. Search for Plain Talk with Rob Port. You'll find it, and that's a great way to listen. And, uh, of course, uh, as always... A lot of what we talk about is my writing on the show. That, that tends to be the genesis for a lot of our discussions or things that I've written. And if you want to read the things that I've written, you got to be a subscriber to, uh, well, any of the North Dakota publications that are owned by Forum Communications Company. Fargo Forum, Grand Forks Herald, Dickens and Press, Jamestown Sun. You subscribe to one, you get them all, plus you get a lot of content across Minnesota. We have we have papers in Minnesota. Hey, we're a big company. We got lots of stuff. But anyway, it's 10 bucks a month. You get all of our content. Um, you can keep up on North Dakota news. I would argue that we're, we're I mean, it, just in terms of covering statewide news. I mean, even if we don't have a publication in your specific community, I promise you we're reporting stuff that you want to know about across the region, across North Dakota. Uh, easiest place to go to get a f- subscription probably in terms of a URL is inforum.com forward slash subscribe. Go there, sign up, and uh, if you do, thanks for your support. All right, joining me as he always does on Wednesday is uh, Chad Oban. Now, a little bit later in the show, we're going to be talking with uh, normally, we start off with a guest, but this time the guest is going to be in the second half. Uh, Jeremy Jackson, who is from North Dakota State University, um, he made an argument about school choice and generated a lot of a lot of um, feedback on that. And uh, we're and we actually talked about school choice last Wednesday on, on the show that came up a little bit. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that this show with Jeremy Jackson. Um, but first, Chad and I are going to talk about some things, and I guess. You know, the first thing to talk about, Chad, I, I know I've, I've written a column about it. I discussed it on the show a little bit, but the passing of Attorney General um, Wayne Stenjum, who, d- despite holding partisan elected office for 40 years, um, has emerged from that political career. Um, is beloved too strong a word? I mean, it just it's very respected widely um, across factions in North Dakota. Um, was a, was a man who really, really had a lot of friends and a lot of admirers. Yeah, um, I, I think the word beloved works uh, for him. You know, I'm I'm I wasn't close with Wayne. Obviously, I'd spent some time over the years with him, but many, many, many of my Democrat friends um, are close friends with him. I mean, like spend holidays, go to his house for Fourth of July regardless of their partisanship. He was uh, exceptionally nice to my wife when she was elected to the Senate, uh, was very fond of reminding her that she was his senator uh, whenever he talked to her about an, uh, an issue and obviously in a very nice way. But yeah, I mean, it's absolutely devastating news and from a really like personal level, uh, I mean, so Wayne just announced what last month yeah. that he wasn't running for reelection. Um, you know, his his love of his wife and, you know, this is what you wait for um, in order to spend time with uh, your spouse and travel the world and enjoy retirement. And I think anytime this sort of thing happens, it's it's absolutely devastating. And, you know, in, in to his son, I mean, I'm I'm part of the, you know, the club who's, whose dad's passed away. And my wife is one of those per- people whose dad has passed away. It's devastating at no matter what age, um, to lose your father and to lose your spouse. And I just can't say enough thoughts and prayers to the Stenjum family and everybody who cared about him. I mean, I, and I'm not going to come, I'm, I don't have rose colored glasses. I mean, I don't love a lot of the stuff that Wayne did at the end in terms of um, lawsuits, um, you know, pushing back on Biden and whatever, but in terms of public service, I mean, the guy's a, I mean, he's somebody that we should all try to live up to. Right. And it's it's not about agreeing on ideology. I mean, so much so right. much that that's what drives so much, I think, of what's wrong today is we think in order to be friends with somebody, they have to view 
government health care policy the same way I do or, or whatever. And it's just not that way. Like you can you and you and I or, or you and anybody else can have very, very different ideas about the way things ought to be run while simultaneously respecting one another and understanding the, the goal is is the same. We all want prosperity yeah. and happiness and opportunity and and all of those things. And I think I think Wayne uh, what, what I wrote about Wayne is I thought that he exemplified a public service first approach to public service. I mean, so much of it now has become entertainment has become spectacle. Um, and he wasn't, um, you know, he was funny and he was charming and he wasn't above using those gifts, gifts to advance his cause. But, you know, the first and foremost, the, the man served North Dakota. And I think, uh, I think that was worth remembering. The first time I met him, funny enough, the first time I met Wayne, and I wrote about this in, in my column about a Monday, was at the Norse Coast Fest in Minot. And I wasn't a professional writer yet. Um, I was still managing a farm store in Minot by the name of, of Home of Economy. And one of the things we sold at, we sold a lot of like Lefsa grills. At, we had like, a, I don't know, weirdly at this farm <laughs> store, we, we sold Lefsa, Lefsa supplies. And so we were out at, at Hoost Fest, we had a booth. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm up to my I'm up to my elbows and lefts of grills, which I I suppose you call lefts of griddles, as your wife corrected me, on uh, on Twitter. She she came at me and she said, you know, you need to call them lefts of griddles and not grills. And I got really mad because I don't like being corrected. And then I realized that she was right, and that made me even madder at her. So, um, no, I, I, that's that is the most relatable thing you've ever said on this show to me. Yeah, Rob, uh, being corrected by your wife. Yeah, <laughs> and it's worse when she's right, right? It's, well, it, and, and what's funny about that Norse Coast Fest was the first time you met Wayne, but I don't know if you realize this, but Aaron was on stage. She told me that with, story. Yeah. With Carl with Rowe, because Earl Car Pomeroy was being, so so the reason why Wayne was there is he was there with Carl Rowe, which is why this was, like, it's not so weird to see the Attorney General at the Hoost Fest. North Dakota is a very small place. I used, I, I one time ran into John Hoven in the grocery store in Minot, right? So, this I, I ran into I ran into Kevin Kramer and his family eating breakfast at Charlie's in downtown Minot like not that long ago. So um, they were in town for a sports tournament or something. Um, North Dakota is just that kind of a place. But but like Wayne Stendrup and Carl Rove come walking around the corner. Right. And I'm like, what, what is going on? And Carl Rove is there to be inducted into the North Hoost Fest Hall of Fame, Scandinavian Hall of Fame. And so is Earl Pomeroy. And uh, yeah, Aaron sent me a nice message about how they got to hang out, and Wayne was so charming, and her, her, and Car uh, he and Carl teased her for being, you know, the Democrat, because I guess, I guess Pomeroy couldn't make it would have been Congressman Pomeroy at that point uh, couldn't make it to the uh, couldn't make it to the event, but yeah, um, yeah. So Aaron was working for Earl at the time, so Earl was there via satellite, and. I was there. Uh, I was actually put at a table with uh, a bunch of Norwegians who didn't really speak English. And so my I was watching her on stage, like palling around with Carl Rove and Wayne Stenjum. And I'm at this table where nobody speaks the same language as I do, thinking, boy, she looks like she's having a heck of a lot more fun. But I mean, I think that's another example of Wayne Stenjum. So here's this this young person who worked for Earl Pomeroy on stage i'm sure she was nervous sitting next to carl rove and the attorney general and wayne made her feel completely comfortable we ended up having our picture taken with carl rove and joking uh to him about hey we're gonna make fun of the fact we're having our picture taken with you this isn't something that's going on our mantle this is going to be for a joke and uh carl rove thought that was funny and and wayne was obviously part of that so good yeah, man i um yeah it, it's when when wayne introduced me because i mean i was writing at the time and the blog had some notoriety but i wasn't doing it professionally and so wayne introduced me to carl rove of all people as the best political writer in north dakota and i'm sure carl rove is standing there looking at this guy hawking lefts of griddles see i got it right that time <laughs> hawking lefts of griddles saying this guy is the is the best political writer in the state, and I, I'm sure it was rank flattery. Like I, don't, I mean that was, but that was Wayne, right? It didn't come off as flattery yeah. coming from him. Um, but anyway, it, he'll be well, he'll be I, sorely I sorely get missed. An image an image out of my head of walking to Toasted Frog years ago, and Wayne and Beth. I mean, like you talk about running into elected officials. I mean, that's just what you do when you live in Bismarck. But he and in Beth were at the at the bar looking at like travel magazines like they were clearly planning a trip together and you could see that they were like giddy and excited about planning this trip and again this was probably five or six years ago 
and the, the the image of that just sort of popped in my head the last week or so and and thinking about how sad that is um really you know. that really is um all right let's get to let's get to the purpose of this show um talk politics uh this week you know I, one of the stories i wrote this week was actually um bob wheeler who is not a household name in North Dakota, but he did he did represent the faction that we've of the North Dakota Republican Party that we've spent so much time talking about over the last year, the Bastiat Caucus or whatever. He he ran for chairman of the North Dakota Republican Party. It got I mean he 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 lost by a wide margin, but got more votes from on the state committee than than maybe um, you might realize. Um, this guy is a prolific. Facebooker, um, you know, kind of, kind of that quintessential, right? Kind of fits that mold of the the sort of boomer Facebooker, angry about everything, anti-vax, all that stuff. Was on there. Um, was involved in a allegedly involved in a drunk driving felony. He's now charged with DUI felony because it resulted in a, in a serious injuries to his wife. Um, according to the report filed by McLean County deputies, he. Um, flipped over his ATV, um, was was wearing only shorts and no shoes in January in North Dakota, uh, driving around on the side-by-side. It was like 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, uh, two, like, like o- o- over an hour and a half later, um, had a point one, uh, over an hour and a half after the deputy was dispatched, had a point one six blood alcohol level. Um, resisted arrest. Um, like, like got into some sort of a scrap with the, uh, with the EMT. I'm working on getting the, the body cam video, but so this happens and, and maybe, maybe it's unfair to, to single out. And, and really, I, I think anybody who's involved in public politics or in, in, you know, if, if you're going to be involved in activism and politics, you you, you become a public figure. And so when things like this happen to you or you're responsible for doing things as the case may be, this becomes news. But the reason why I bring it up is because there's a point at which one of the reasons why I started writing so much about the, the Bastiat caucus or the faction of this faction of Republicans is because every every cycle we would have, you know, during the campaigns and then during the legislative session, we get news stories about these Republicans who say crazy things or do crazy things. And everybody tries to paint like this is this is the North Dakota Republican Party. This is who they are. And it was really actually a very specific faction of the North Dakota Republican Party. That, that does these sorts of things. And I mean, that's what I wanted to write about. And I think this is another example of that. And we can go down the list where we had, you know, Representative Jeff Hoverson in, um, you know, during the session who insulted his own, um, insulted his own majority leader. We had Luke Simons who was expelled from the legislature amid accusations of sexual harassment. Um, you know, we have, you know, Jeff Magrum had a blow up and like a like a screaming altercation with with a fellow Republican representative Mike Brandenburg some time ago. Um, you know, you have Senator Jason Heitkamp who you know was posting on Facebook about lynching Barack Obama and then manages to get himself elected. He's riding around in the truck during the special session that says "F Joe Biden" on it. Um, I mean, at some point, I, I, I think it's unfair to, to take like anybody could go down and say this Democrat's an awful person and they got caught saying awful things and they're the chairman of some Democratic committee or they're some backbencher congressperson or something like that. And you could do the same for Republicans. Any any large group of people, there's some crazies, right? There's a point, though, at which there's a pattern of behavior from this very specific faction of Republicans that I felt is notable and is the reason that's been driving my coverage of them and I'm just wondering if you're if you see the same thing where it's just it, it, at some point it's like this isn't this isn't just circumstance right this this doesn't just keep happening by accident. Yeah, I, I think you might be letting Republicans generally off the hook a little bit more than you should be here, though. You know, when you look at the election for chairman, um, Wheeler got 19 votes out of like 50. I mean, that's like you know a third. That's about 40. But I think I calculated he got about a third of the votes. Yeah. That's not just some tiny minority. I acknowledge right? That's that. not just Charles Tuttle getting five percent at the convention versus Kelly Armstrong. I mean, this is a pretty substantial number of of folks. Um, so I think there has to be some ownership. Um, you know, I I've, I'm sure I've talked about on this show before that I went to a Republican convention 
It's when Kelly was nominated, Congressman Armstrong, so whatever year that was, 2018, 2018 probably. Yeah. And one of the things that I was sort of taken aback by was sort of who we've described as the normies sort of chumming around and, um, you know, trying to get the support of these Bastiat folks. Now, don't get me wrong. I see since 2018 uh, the sort of level and the examples that you used have really taken off. And I suspect that's probably more confrontational now. But um, part of me thinks the, the Republicans, you know, establishment, use these folks um, for political gain at some point, and now it's coming back to bite them. But um, yeah, I mean, b Jason Heitkamp has to own Jason Heitkamp's behavior, right? Jeff Hoverson has to own Jeff Hoverson's behavior. Luke Simons has to own Luke Simons' behavior. Um, but I also know from personal experience, when you've got candidates who are running who have some deep flaws and then the governor or U.S. senators or whatever are appearing on their mailings during election time. And so I think there has to be some ownership. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to get into specific examples, but um, I, guess I suppose I could. But, you know, I think there has to be some ownership. Those examples you used are crazy. I mean, they're, they're just they don't they don't deserve to be part of the public discourse of elected officials. Um, and as we've talked about before, Democrats aren't beating these guys. Democrats aren't beating these people in the vast majority of these districts that are 75 percent Republicans. That's a clean your own house sort of thing. Right. Well, there, I mean, there's a, there's an argument to be made that because I, I think I think you have a fair point. I, I, and I would note this is not just a phenomena on, on the right. Um, I mean, we've had we've had instances. Uh, rep State Representative uh, Mary Adams, right, from from Grand right. Forks, who was posting, comparing. God, what was it? She was comparing conservatives to like Hitler or Nazis or something terrible. Um, never, never use Hitler or Nazis as a comparison. It's just never stop. good. Just stop. Just stop. Yep. I, I, I re it, sometimes it's like it's like that's the only historical reference we know how to make, right? <laughs> like nobody's 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 comparing somebody to like Scipio Africanus or something, right? It's yeah. so, it's always Hitler. Like, like that's you, the one you're thing. A Nazi, right? Well, that's well, that's also all the History Channel is too. It's it's aliens and Nazis, and that's it. Um, anyway, and we're gonna talk about public education here in a little bit. Maybe that could be a part of it. We could learn something other than World War Two. Uh, anyway, well, uh, but you know, we have to be very careful about how we teach history uh, these days. Well, we do. Well, yeah, because you can't make anybody happy. I mean, I, yep. I, I my wife's going to be a teacher and I'm that scares me because you, you can't make anybody happy right now. Right or left. Anyway, um, back to what we're talking about. I, I think you're right. But the North Dakota Republican Party doesn't need this faction. Right. And you look at it like with the with the Luke Simons expulsion. Right. Which I think was kind of the even if even if I mean, just pulling the Democratic votes in the House out of it. And you and then and then pull the Bastiat votes against expelling Simons out. That's still a governing majority, and not a, not a small one, in the North yeah. Dakota House of Representatives. So that's just the non-Bastiat Republicans. They don't need them. They don't need them, right? And but I I think there's this feeling like we have to have an 80 percent majority, so we have to tolerate some of these people because if we don't tolerate them, then a Democrat might win. And, and in a lot of these districts, you're right, a Democrat's not going to win there. Right. So you don't well, have to tolerate a crazy person. Yeah. And I saw a comment from Chairman Schaefer recently where he was talking about his job is to bring all the factions of the Republican Party. Well, he together. gave that quote to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And but to fight off the socialist Democrats in North Dakota. Socialist Democrats in North Dakota. I mean, I know most of the legislators up there, not a lot of socialists to be found. Um but I mean, that's sort of, and I know Perry Schaefer's job is to elect Republicans. That's literally his only job. Um, and you held that idea, position. I mean, you know, you know, you held that position for Democrats. So I mean, you, we're not chairman, I guess. But right. I mean, that is his only job. But at the same time, at some point, a normal Republican is better for the state of North Dakota, and likely the agenda that the um, majority party and the governor's office are pushing. A Democrat can often be more helpful than a Bastiat member in pushing what they're trying to do for the people of North Dakota. I think that's I think that's right. Probably a lot of the time. Um, the other argument, I, I mean, because from my perspective, because this is my movement, right? You want to talk about cleaning your own house? 
That's what I've been trying to do. This is my movement. These are people who are going around saying, we're the true conservatives. We're the actual Republicans. And other people are, are rhinos, Republicans in name only. We stand for what's really Republicanism or what's really conservatism, which bothers me. Because um, I, don't, I don't consider myself a Republican. I, I need to be independent from that. So I don't participate in partisan politics that way. But I do very much consider myself to be a member of the conservative movement. I've spent my adult life promoting this movement, this philosophy. I care about it. And it bothers me when it's when it's associated with charlatans and, and crazy people and conspiracy theories and people who aren't pursuing truth. And, you know, I, th there's a point at which I, I understand what, what Chairman Schaefer's trying to do. And I think he's trying to pour some oil on the waters. Um, and, and if you look right now, I mean... Thanks after redistricting, you know, the some of the local legislative districts are having to redistrict again. This spring, when all of the districts were doing their reorganizations, you know, they put a they put a massive effort into trying to elect their own people to to, to local leadership because in turn, right, local leadership then gets to elect statewide party leadership. So um and they didn't they didn't get any ground. In fact, you could argue they went backwards a little bit. And it's happening again in, in the districts that have had to reorganize so far because of redistricting and I think I don't know how many I think there's about a half dozen left I'd have to look at my list which I don't have in front of me but I mean just just so far we're talking about they're losing ground again which I just wrote about this week where um you know uh, Luke Simons's brother over in a uh, what was it 37 or Dickinson area d district he um or maybe that's 39 I'm forgetting he lost um yeah I'm always confused on with the new redistricting because 26, I think, is out there now. 39 is out yeah. there. 36, 26, 20, 26, the Bastiat faction. I mean, they, they, uh, Gretchen Stengem lost his district chair. So that was a pickup for them. But everywhere else, I mean, uh, uh, Luke Simonson's brother lost. Um, you had uh, John Enderley, who was, a, who was the district chair in Luke Simonson's old district, who called his expulsion from the legislature an atrocity. He just got defeated. So they're continuing to lose ground. So maybe, you know, maybe, I mean, I there's obviously efforts within the Republican Party to push back on this. And so Schaefer, at least public facing, is trying to keep the party united while simultaneously, I would argue, behind the scenes, you know, they are trying to clean house. Right. Yeah. And I think that it's a, it's a tough position for some of the um, elected officials. I've talked to Republican elected officials who I respect very much and said, you know, why aren't you standing up to these guys? And often the response is, I, I don't need the bullseye on me. I, I don't need these guys coming after me, attacking me on social media, attacking you know my family and whatever. And so it's easier to just sort of go along and get along, which I completely get, mind you. Um, but that sort of leads us to to where we're at now. Do I? I had a thought this morning. You're familiar with the idea of the the Overton window, right? It's a uh... It's a concept in politics. It came up with a, a guy who used to work for a, a conservative um, advocacy group called the Mackinac Center out of Michigan. And the Overton window is essentially at any one moment, there's a window of acceptable ideas for the public, like like things that you could campaign on that could be real campaign issues that are going to draw people to them. For instance, like um, same-sex marriage, right? At one time in American history was outside of that window. Right. That was not something that was politicians weren't going to talk about it, but the window shifted and you could argue activists and everything shifted the window. And now it's in the window and now it's very much something that you could support. Um, and so if, if you think about that window, I, I think I think what's happened with that is po elected leaders, politicians have become dependent on like like their the ideological media and activists and everything instead of leading and trying to move that window themselves, they become dependent on kind of the activist class to move the window for them, and then they come in after the fact. And I, I think, I mean, maybe in some ways that makes sense, and in some ways I've kind of thought of myself in that frame, like, like it's my job to go out there and make arguments for conservative ideas that then can, can create room so that policymakers can make conservative policy. But I, I think the problem is, is that by the politicians giving that up, it's like they've given up their ability to lead, right? And so they're waiting for the window to move. And, and right now, right now, the base of the Republican Party is moving the window towards anti-vaxxer stuff. We're moving it towards election conspiracy theories and everything. And I think a lot of the elected officials, they know that it's wrong. 
And I don't even think they really want the window going in that direction, but they're not used to standing up and trying to move the window themselves. But Rob, do you think the the average Republican in the state of North Dakota, um, you know, under the the window theory, is where that window is now? I mean, I think the activists are the people who are showing up for meetings, the people who are yelling at legislators. That's where they are. But do you think the average Republican waking up in the morning, getting their kids to school, and whatever, that's what they care about? I, th- I, th- or do I think. Just, or do they I, just I think, want their streets plowed? I, I think. Well, yeah, the, the plow the damn roads caucus, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's the divide is between Republicans who are what you just described, who are, I want to make education policy and I want to make tax policy and I want to promote North Dakota and making a wonderful place to live versus the Bastiat caucus, which is we want to try to make policy based on whatever Tucker Carlson was talking about last night. Um, that I think that's the divide. And yeah. but, the, but the problem is, is, is I think the people in the just plow the roads caucus are afraid of of what happens because the window's moving and well, or they just don't have time for the garbage right and I, I mean if you're just the the plow the roads caucus i mean are you going to go and spend six hours at a district meeting to watch people spew and yell and you know be crazy um people have better things to do than that and again this isn't a right left uh, right, just a right thing i mean i think it probably goes for well, you, you've sides. talked about you've you've spoken yeah. about that on, on, in your I, I don't I don't go to Democrat meetings anymore. Part of it is for professional reasons, but part of it is um, I don't see the point um, to just go in and complain about what our friends are doing or what the enemies are doing. I shouldn't say enemy. We've learned that people on the other side um, are saying and not actually wanting to move the ball forward um, to just cause chaos and complain. Um, I'm getting too old for that, I think. Yeah. And part of the problem is is the plow the damn roads issues aren't sexy like they're not good for entertainment nobody in talk radio wants to start talking you know spend a a segment talking about the transportation budget unless there's something in there that's gonna make people mad right unless there's something like there's either there's funding in there for critical race theory or something right like that without that hook like they're not just gonna talk about well you know gosh we should be spending money on our bridges because they're collapsing right like nobody it's not as sexy as as you know. It's not, that's the hard thing is is the, the public is sort of drawn to these issues. The public is more I would argue is more involved in politics than ever before. Thanks to social media, where it's easy, where anybody could spend five minutes in their dentist you know office room engaging in some keyboard activism on Facebook. Um, I feel like that was a very it. personal example that you just used. Have you written a blog from your dentist office before? I have. I have. Boy, I have. I have stories about where I've written blog posts from. Uh, when I because when I got started, like Wi-Fi was a relatively new thing, and I think you know I spent ten years as a. I, I'm probably admitting too much here, but I spent ten years as a private investigator, right? And so that meant a lot of years doing surveillance. I like we literally had a surveillance van because we would like uh, do stuff like insurance fraud and everything. And I used to bring a laptop because surveillance would get very, very boring. So I would bring a laptop and I would I would park the surveillance van so I could get somebody's Wi-Fi, you know, because like like smartphones and everything weren't a thing back then. So I would park my surveillance van so I could get on somebody's Wi-Fi and I would blog while I was on surveillance. Um, Well, getting us back on topic really quickly. uh, (laughs) One of the errors that I think that have been made over the last several years by sort of the Republican um, establishment normies is thinking that throwing the Bastiats a a little win um, would somehow satisfy them, you know, be it the the mask mandate, reducing it down just to, you know, banning statewide, those kind of things. And in reality, all it did was empower folks. They feel like, you know, now they, they, they can point to some wins. I'm not sure that there is a better alternative. I mean, killing uh, the stuff that they're bringing, but it, it sort of empowers them to bring more of these Tucker Carlson issues um, to the legislature every year. Or Rachel Maddow issues or whatever. But it lets the, um, I, I think the rebuttal, I think if we brought one of them on and asked them, why did you do this watered down version of the ban on vaccine mandates? And they yeah. would argue that, well, we're trying to be responsive to the people, right? Like that would be their argument is we're trying to, do what the people want us to do. This is this. There's a very large contingent of our constituents that are asking for this, and we're trying to give them that 
in the most sane way. I mean, they could make sort of a populist argument. I'm not even a populist, but I guess a, a democratic, small d democracy um, argument for that. That that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to deliver that to them. And but I would say that the the they're responding to the majority of people who contact them not the majority of people who actually live in well, the that, Well, that, that was my argument when I was talking about the Overton window. Sometimes leadership does need to be – I mean, we, we spend so much time talking about the grassroots and denigrating sort of the, the political elite and everything else. Maybe sometimes leadership really does need to be top down, right? Sometimes well, a leader needs to stand up and say, no, I'm sorry. I realize maybe I'm in the minority right now, but this is wrong. And, and if a legislator, the only thing they're doing is tallying up how many emails they get – I mean, we just as well could just have a, a accounting machine up there to vote red or green. I will never run for elected office um, because I could never get elected, and I would be terrible at it. Um, but and, and maybe 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 putting those caveats in front of what I'm about to say is is gonna defeat my own argument. But I don't know if I held if I held in the legislative office. I don't know other than getting data and facts and information. I don't know how much time I would spend, you know, trying to survey my constituents, right? Like I would, I would try to get elected on a platform and then I would pursue that platform. And then when it comes campaign season, then I'm going to try and articulate what I did to my constituents. And if they want more of that, I guess they'll vote for me. And if they don't, well, then I guess I'll find something else to do with my time. That, yeah. And I think that often elected officials take the easy way out of saying, I've heard more from my constituents on this side or that side. We also know that elected officials, state, federal, everywhere will use contacts from constituents if it well, fits Well, cherry pick them too. Yeah, for, for yeah. sure. But um, I so I think at a future, I know that we're up against the clock here, but I would love to talk about state Senate races. I think that's going to be where the fight is. Uh, I, I, I think you're right. We actually we, we were supposed to talk about that. And then we got off down on this other this other road, including my anecdote about blogging from a surveillance van. Which probably no, I'm sure the people no. love that. You think, though, you think, sure you think they love gonna, that? Little, gonna get them coming back. Get them coming back is uh, how I used to steal people's <laughs> Wi-Fi all the time. Um yeah, so we're going to go. Uh, Jeremy Jackson from North Dakota State University is going to be joining us next. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about school choice. Okay, welcoming to the program now, Dr. Jeremy Jackson. He's the director of North Dakota State University, uh, director of the North Dakota State University Center for the Study of Public Choice and Private Enterprise. He's also a professor of economics in the NDSU Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. He recently wrote a letter to the editor uh, of the Fargo Forum, my uh, my employer, saying give families the power of school choice. Dr. Jackson, welcome, welcome. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me here, Rob. What uh, define school choice? What are you arguing for? School choice is really just the idea that the school that you attend should not be defined by your address. That you should have an alternative other than the geographically assigned school um, down the street, so to speak. I mean, that's the broadest sense. Yeah, uh, Rob, I don't know if you want me to jump in now, but well, I think we sort, of talk, we sort of talked about this on the way in, you know, full disclosure, my real job is working for North Dakota United, which, um, uh, which represents teachers. It's a teachers union, public employees union in the state. So I have, uh, professionally and personally, very strong opinions that probably don't line up with Dr. Jackson uh, on this. But also in terms of full disclosure, I mean, the organization that Dr. Jackson works for at NDSU is largely funded um, by the Charles Koch uh, Foundation. They gave $10 million last year, and one of the Koch Foundation's goals is to weaken public education, expand choice, and, and, and that kind of thing. So I think that if we're going to be completely transparent here, we should be transparent yeah. on, on, on who we're talking to here. Although I, I, although I and I think maybe, maybe, maybe Dr. Jackson might, might disagree with the idea that the goal is to weaken public education, we might argue that the goal is to try to strengthen the sort of education that the public provides by, by providing choice. Is that, I mean, let's, let's, let's get right into that. Dr. Jackson, why is why is choice and, and and by the way, I think when we talk about school choice, a lot of times it's just people's immediately goes like vouchers or some form of money following students to some sort of private education, homeschool or charter school or a private school or what have you. It can also mean things like open enrollment, right? It can also mean th mean things like I don't necessarily have to go to 
the public school that's right down the block, I can also maybe go to the public school across town if that works better for me. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways for choice to be policy. No, you're absolutely right. School choice is not just one thing. Um, and it is based on that idea that you should, in some way, um, have a choice when it comes to what school you, your children actually attend. Um, in, in Fargo, for instance, it's not a rule that you have to attend the, the school that's geographically assigned to you, but to attend a separate school, you have to get permission. So you're not guaranteed that you will get to have your child attend a different school. Um, and you are also then responsible for all transportation. Um, so, so there is a certain amount of choice amongst the public schools that exist in our district, but I'm not righted that choice, and I still have parts of my own expense that I that I pay for. For instance, and and you know, learning about school choice has been uh, kind of a, a long journey for me. Um, but my wife is from the state of Wisconsin. Um, and actually, Minnesota has some similar rules, too. But they believe that the state has a responsibility to educate the children wherever they choose to be educated. So they're involved in it everywhere. And that one of the things that the state is responsible for is transporting students to the school of their choice. Um, my, my wife attended a variety of schools when she was a child, but she did attend, you know, they decided that the Catholic high school was the best one for her to attend. And she got there on a school bus that was paid for by the state of Wisconsin. Um, so, I mean, there's even that aspect of transportation and, and how do your kids get to school? What it, and it does really come down to what is it that we are trying to achieve? Do we lift up the traditional public school as the end all be all or are we interested in thinking about, are our students getting the best education that we can get them that fits their individual needs? Yeah, and I, and I think that's a, a really fair place to start this conversation from, um, because I think so often, I think Rob's column this morning sort of laid it out that we, we get into these ideological fights that uh, I'll be honest, I'm prone to fall into on this subject. Um, but, you know, in your column, Dr. Jackson, you brought up two policies, and one was the idea of public charters, and the other one was um, voucher schemes, as uh, Rob uh, likes to point out that I call them schemes. I, I want to touch a little bit on the first one, the public charters. Um, I'm a little confused on the need for public charters in North Dakota when we already have, like, the vast innovation waivers that have passed. I mean, public schools can pretty much do whatever they want right now. And so reading about public charters, it seems like it wouldn't change necessarily what would happen in our schools or what could happen. I'm not saying it's actually happening in our public schools. I would be an advocate for changing our public schools to be more innovative. But it seems like the public charter idea just would remove some transparency and accountability to taxpayers. Um, so I guess my question is, what can't we do already in public schools in terms of innovation? And maybe, I mean, we don't have a seat time rule. You can get that waived. Um, you know, we supported last session the yes, every kid uh, get in a, a credit um, for internships in the arts and in physical ed, um, internships through CTE, like real life experience, which I think we can all agree needs to be part of all of our education. So. I'm a little confused on why we need the public charter rule in North Dakota when I think we can already do everything that you're advocating for. Um, and you know, there's there's of course fair points all around, but but I I do think that charter schools have a potential to to at least increase the options that we have when it comes down to it. Do we really have any innovative alternatives? For instance. Um, some parents think that their children would be better off in, in a same-sex school, an all-boys school or an all-girls school. Um, charter schools can have that type of a mission um, if, they, if they so choose. Um, the, the niche that the charter school fills is really defined in the charter. So it's not designed necessarily by, by the school board, I guess. So it, it doesn't limit innovation to the local school board. 
Um, you create a charter that has a purpose, and ultimately, if that charter school is going to succeed, it has to attract students. So yeah. there is accountability in the fact that the charter cannot exist without students, and no child is forced to go to a charter school. One one yeah. way one argument against a lot of this that because uh, we we talked about this last week too, and 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 argue, and I I think it's a fair argument is, which I brought up in my my column today as well, is is the accountability question, which is you know if I want to know if I want to know how much my school district's paying spending on everything from pencils to administrative salaries, um, I can ask. And in fact, we have laws. They have to turn over that information. Um, you know, there's a concern about if, if it's a private school, maybe we're not going to have that level of accountability. But, but accountability can be a two-edged sword insofar as in a society like ours, we implement accountability through the political process. We have elected leaders who, and, and granted, even though they're, they're nonpartisan, I think we all know, there's plenty of politics at school board meetings. Um, in fact, school board meetings have become kind of a, the front lines of, of the culture war. Now, I would argue that that one way in, in, in the American system of government, we sought to sort of tamp down, um, and we've, we've gotten away from this maybe somewhat, but, but sort of tamp down the passions of, 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 of the raw political masses is we distributed political power, right? No one, you know, the three branches of government, no one branch can act unilaterally. Um, Congress is split into two houses. The state governments are sovereign. We distributed that power. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, as we look across the, the, the landscape and we see that, you know, again, we see people screaming at school boards because they're upset about this. And, and it's, it's irrespective of whether you think those people are right or wrong. Um, but, you know, we see people trying to ban books and everything else that's going on. Is school choice a way to sort of insulate ourselves from some of the, 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 the sturm and drang of, of populist politics. So, I mean, that argument is fair, I think, especially when you think about the private school issues. But in the world of public charter schools, I don't, I don't see that argument. Um, part of it is that the charter schools are still public. I don't, I don't know the specifics of how certain transparency laws would actually play out. But one of the things that I think does make charters a potential option, and that's all that I'm really arguing for is that making them, suppose, an option, which they currently aren't. And that was part of the main point is to say, look, we actually don't even have this option in our state at the moment. Um, but their charters are funded by funds coming from the state on a per student basis. That is known. You know how much money the charter school gets per student. And they're accountable to that because that's the source of revenue that they get. That also is one of the ways that charter schools can be used as an option to help control the cost of education. So they, they tend to operate at lower cost than traditional public schools. And that's, that is one of the ways that I see there being a potential benefit for the state of North Dakota. The other one, and this one is even maybe a little bit more controversial and nuanced, <laughs> but you know, I, one of the, co the, the, the common oppositions that I hear to the idea of charter schools in North Dakota is, well, we're a rural state. So why would we need something like charter schools? They're only for urban areas, right? Um, but, but the truth is there, there are a large number of charter schools that operate in urban, or sorry, in rural areas as well. For instance, um, Credo, I don't know if you're familiar with Credo, they do a lot of educational outcome research. They're a, an institute based out of Stanford, but they, they do lots of studies on, on school choice policies and in particular charter schools and the effect on outcomes. Um, Idaho as a state has, has had some really good results on their charter school programs and and in fact with with rural charter schools one of the ways that charter schools have at least the discussion has evolved partly as is, is for, for rural communities that are facing something like a a consolidation in school districts um, as we downsize because of changes in population etc um, families can band together and create a charter school that still stays inside of the community rather than having your children bust, you know, 30 minutes, an hour plus to get to the new 
unified school district. I mean, so there, there are some benefits that can happen from rural school districts as well, having these options for, 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 uh, for charter schools. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about here is, I mean, there is also a large history of, of fraud and other issues with both public and private charters. I mean, I've got a, people listening can't, I mean, this is just a list of all the different cases of people defrauding. And part of that is the, the lack of accountability. I'm still struggling with the public charters though. And if somebody doesn't like the way their public school district is operating, they have the ability. I mean, if Bismarck Public Schools wanted to have a school that was just a French immersion school or an art school, they could do that. There's no need to change policy. They could do that right now if they wanted to. And so I worry that we're again, we're, we're fracturing people. So we're, we're talking about, you know, just a charter school just for boys or just for girls, or maybe it's just kids of a certain income or with certain political thinking, uh, which I think we're starting to see in Fargo. That um, could happen with a, with a public charter school. That would be, uh, I mean, so they have to it's a litmus test. You, you, you wouldn't be able to, 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 to discriminate in that way. I mean, but that, could they, do they have to accept all <laughs> students? So that, that's up to how the charter is written and how the laws are written. Currently, we have no charter. We have, we have no rules on that. Now, it's not impossible to have a charter school that has to accept any applicant. That's not an impossibility. I, I think that's fair. I mean, a lot of it goes into how you design these schools right. and, and how that's, how that's going to work. Um, wh one thing, although Chad touched on it a little bit, and, and one thing, I really like choice, but I my career I started as a as a blogger, right? Writing and and I I was really into the idea of democratizing the media, right? Where I felt that we had gotten kind of monolithic in where, how we get our news and information, and it was good to sort of crack open the doors, break down some of the gatekeepers, and allow other voices in. Um, I feel like the pendulum has maybe swung too far <laughs> in that direction because. Now, um, you know, every random crank on Facebook can reach an audience of potentially millions, and we're struggling with um, false information just across the map. And I don't want to get into that, but I'm looking at our, our society right now, and, and one thing, you know, I'm a conservative, and I, I support choice, but I really worry about people retreating into their bubbles. And so I, I, know, I realize you're kind of making an argument for public charter schools, and we can design it that way, but school, the school choice issue, like if I... It's also homeschooling, right? It's also maybe vouchers. It's also these other things. So if we say that we support school choice generally, how do we make sure that that's not just going to further facilitate Americans retreating into ideological bubbles or cultural bubbles or religious bubbles or whatever bubbles of, of their particular flavor, I guess, that they want? You know, there's nothing that can prevent people who want to live in silos and bubbles from doing so. So... I I really don't think that there's a way that we can can use policy to try to fight it. And I think if that's what you're trying to do with policy, you're also then, again, forcing everybody in some sense to conform to some um, democratically determined standard, which which, you know, we there is a reason that we do have things like constitutional rules as well. Right. It's to protect those who are in a minority viewpoint. So even if you have 51% who want the school system to work one way, it's democratically determined, you still might have some people who, who really have a, a fundamental difference in opinion. And there's a question of whether or not we want, in, in, the, in, in political science, this has been termed the tyranny of the majority. Um, don't know if you're familiar with that, with that concept. Um, yeah, but it's people, why it's why I think I don't think we should get rid of the filibuster, but not, well, let's not I go down either. let's not go down that rabbit hole. So, um, one of the things you talked about is sort of the open enrollment concept um, in public schools, and I think that's a very interesting one that seems to sort of flow. Like, I mean, there's times where open enrollment is more welcomed, and other times where it's less welcomed. The transportation piece, I think, is an interesting one as well. But how do you set up, I mean, I, I just think about Fargo, I think about Bismarck, where you do have different, you know, you've got your neighborhood schools in downtown communities, like in the core communities, and then bigger 
communities outside. You know, I know most of my friends and family in Bismarck would like their kids to go to community, like small neighborhood schools, if possible. How do you like? Not everybody can choose to go to um, Highland Acres Elementary School in Bismarck. How do you control that? I mean, how do you make without without using geographic boundaries for that? How do you make that fair? How, how do I get my choice if everybody wants to go to Highland Acres? Yeah, well, I, the the economics professor might appreciate that you can't deliver an infinite supply of something, or you can't meet infinite demand with finite supply. Um, no, and, and that's actually one of the, the places that at least charter schools have really allowed for some really great academic research. In the cases for which at least charter schools are oversubscribed, that is, they have more students that sign up to attend than what the school can actually accept. Um, they're usually required by law to use a lottery system to allocate those seats. That is, they're randomly it randomly is determined who gets to attend and who doesn't. And that randomization then really revolutionized some of the ability for, for academics to study the effect of attendance at a charter school on certain types of outcomes, um, which in with geographically assigned schools, you, you, you don't have, have really the ability to have that type of random assignment well, that's, that's just kind of one of the, so there are there are i say that to say there are means at which there's there's a school that can only hold so many students and if everybody chooses to go to that school there has to be a system in place you can do something like random assignment you know you get a kindergarten spot you're guaranteed it up through time but so, but the belief would be partly if there's competition for open enroll via open enrollment that also is going to produce changes in the schools where enrollment's declining. Partly, we, we, we see that that's a problem, right? It allows us to use this tool of supply and demand to realize which school is not serving its students well. Well, the one where all the students are fleeing is probably a good indicator that something needs to change. Well, but I would also suggest that the neighborhood, char I'm not even talking about charters, but the neighborhood elementary school is the best way to educate kids, right? Smaller class sizes, teachers get to know the kids and that kind of thing. But the way we're sort of getting at schools now is um, as big as possible, you know, five kindergarten classes, six kindergarten classes. So are we setting up um, parents wanting to get out? Uh, is the way we're now housing children in our schools setting up people wanting to go to a char smaller charter school and that kind of thing. Why aren't we building, uh, now this is unfair to you, but why aren't we building neighborhood schools everywhere in our state? Because that's the best way to do it. That's the best way to educate our kids. And if we're talking about the best way to educate our kids, we can't say the best way to educate our kids is also the cheapest way to educate our kids. Those things never work. So best education though, also when we say the word like best education, we're also not recognizing the fact that, you know, I'm an economist. We're dealing with constrained optimization. We don't have an infinite amount of money to throw at the problem. And infinite amounts of money aren't likely to, you know, there's gonna be a point at which we can't increase teacher quality anymore. We can't increase the quality of, of the school at building itself anymore. Um, so yeah, we wanna have the best education possible for, for our students. Um, but also we don't always know what the best education is for them. And I guess that's that's part of my my over overarching point is we don't really know how to measure education that well. We have certain standardized tests, right, that we can look at certain specific outcomes, but there is more to education than what gets measured in this sort of, you know, what scores did, did our students get on an achievement test? Um, there's the different parts of socialization that go into it. And I guess the main thing that I advocate is just that we should have options on the table and that, that there, there isn't just one size, one solution that fits all. Just because I live in a specific neighborhood doesn't mean that that neighborhood school is the best alternative for my child. And I would suggest we already have that choice. I mean, I, I think ultimately when we start talking about the private school homeschooling thing, we're talking about dollars and cents, right? I'm, 
I'm a proponent of school choice. If you want to homeschool your kid, homeschool your kid. If you want to send your kid to St. Mary's High School if, or the Innovation School here in Bismarck, if you want to do that, go for it. I just don't know that, I don't believe that public dollars should fund that choice. Much like if, you know, I've been sending my kid to pre-K over at the Y, I've never sent my kid to elementary school yet or public schools yet. Should the government pay for, for that? I mean, it, it's, I get, I get concerned when we're, when we're creating a common good and then somebody doesn't like something, so they go out and make a choice and then they expect to pick and choose what their tax dollars go to. But, but what if, and I, I mean, just, just as, as a believer in, in the, at least the concept of school choice, um, I, I think the rebuttal to that argument is we all agree that, that the state has a role in, in facilitating education. And, and, and I, I would argue in, in providing the means for education. That doesn't mean we have to deliver it through the mechanism that we're using now. I think that we could serve that goal maybe in different ways um, so, by, by, so by well, easing, so, easing up. And rather, rather than having a mono, more monolithic system, have a system that encompasses more choice. So, Rob, if I'm a, a liberal who wants to defund the police... And yeah. instead wants my money to go to social workers walking around my neighborhood. Yeah, we're having that debate, aren't we? I mean, we're not, not well, North Dakota, we're not but, having that debate, but, but parts but of the me, world but, we are. But, hold, but me as an individual, do right. I get to make that choice? Well, that's, and I then mean, you'll fund my social worker? Well, that's, I mean, well, I, I, mean if, if, I guess if you can build the political consensus it takes to implement that sort of policy, then that's the policy we have to live with. That, which is kind of the bugaboo about living in a society like ours is, we talked about a little bit about the tyranny of the majority. I think sometimes that's why we have to be a little bit scared about political majorities just sort of trampling minority rights. But in a larger sense, we have to live with public policy we don't like all the time. Um, I, I, have a, I have a wide libertarian streak. Um, I, I, there are times I get, I'm not sure we should have a drinking age, frankly. I mean, that's how wide out I am. So, But I live with these policies. These are the rules. This is the law. You know, so so that that Chad Oban doesn't like the idea of private schools is not necessarily a compelling argument against them. Listen, I don't have a problem with private schools. My wife taught at a private oh, school. Okay, that was unfair. I mean, fair let, enough. let's you know we we talk about this in terms of either somebody's for choice or not for choice. I think it's how That's you implement not, the choice. I I, I think yeah, we're, I think of, of I, course yeah, right of, of course. And like your column earlier today, where you pointed out polling that forty six percent of Democrats support school choice. Well, I'd be one of those 46. Right. Well, that, that's the problem with the polling is what does school choice right. mean? Does it mean vouchers or does it mean open enrollment or or does it mean um, homeschool? Well, I mean, what, what, is it, what does it mean? I mean, it can mean a lot of Rob, things. You're the one that used the poll We're to try to prove so the point, not me. Uh, right. <laughs> well, I, I, you, I, well, I use the poll. I use the poll in a very broad sense to illustrate that it, uh, rebutting an argument that this was school choice was somehow like a right wing plot. Obviously, depending on how you define school choice, it has a broader base of appeal maybe than a lot of people think we have just a few minutes left with dr jackson one thing i wanted to get you to, to talk about because one, one of the big arguments against school choice is the and I, I realize you said that with a charter school you can design the charter in a way maybe to to address this but one of the big arguments is that private schools or charter schools or whatever they get to be selective in the students that they enroll um and and maybe like if you have a lottery system but but you said that that some charter schools have gotten away from because that's their argument like like private schools do better their students perform better because they don't have to accept all comers but you're saying that some charter schools do because it's random they don't get to just select or pick and choose so so tell us more about what that has shown like those charter schools are they still performing well or what i guess i guess tell us more of what what that is so the, that that is the, the the lotteries are used when there's more people who apply for the open positions than what there are. There are still going to be maybe some admissions criteria that everybody's fitting okay. the admissions criteria. So it's not perfectly random. My point random. is just that that any sort of rules on like on what a charter school is forced to accept in terms of a student is part of the law and the nature of the law and what will be spilled spelled out in the charter of the school itself. So it's not a function of charter schools per se, but it is true that if you if you create a charter law that forces the charter school to to completely emulate everything about the, the traditional public school, then the ability for cost savings is gonna is gonna disappear very quickly. Um, that that is part of the way that there is cost savings by using a charter school is by allowing them to be different 
than the public school. So just one last thing. I think, you know, Rob, uh, in your last question, you were sort of putting the voucher private school argument together with the public charter. Uh, are, I mean, they are very different conversations, That's right? True. And I think, again, we're probably guilty of we're talking about school choice. We've talked about open enrollment. We've talked about public charters. Uh, we haven't really gotten to vouchers and private schools and home schools and all those kind of things, because that's where we get into the funding sort of how do you how do you properly fund public education while still having a, a voucher scheme that that with money going to private schools. So that's so I think char public charters are a, a, a really good conversation for us to have. I just still question that we can't do the vast majority of it with the policies we have on the books because we have very flexible um, rules in terms of what public schools can do in this state. And, and, and so I just don't know that we need to set up another policy to do public charters. We should spend another 30 minutes on vouchers and um, education savings accounts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, at well, another well day. we should. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's where we should have started this conversation. But I and, 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 and Chad probably I mean, maybe maybe it's a question of taking a Chad probably no, I, I'm certain knows North Dakota's education policies better than than I do by dint of his his day job. But if it's if this is already possible under the law, then maybe it's just a matter of taking those elements of law and and consolidating them into some sort of a charter making it making it you know formalizing it like let's formalize it this is a thing that's possible but, like it's already technically possible let's formalize it and make it specifically possible but i would also just add one last thing i mean to to dr jackson's points here you also need to have um school board members and education leaders who are willing to do something differently um you know we talk a lot about parents wanting things to be done like they've always been done I would suggest there's lots of education leaders in this state um, who are in the same boat. You know, this is the way I, I taught when I taught 20 years ago. We need to be thinking about educating our kids differently. Dr. Jackson hit on social and emotional learning, and that needs to be part of, of the, you know, the, it's not just a test score. We need to be creating good citizens. And if our public schools aren't doing that, I would rather us beef up our, our public schools to make sure they are doing right by every kid uh, rather than diverting money to another place. Well, Dr. Jackson, you, you promised us 30 minutes. You gave us 30 minutes. I appreciate that. So we won't take up any more of your time. But I, I think this was a great discussion. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you.